Welcome. My name is Evan Clark. I am Executive Director of Atheists United in Los Angeles, California. We're California's largest and most active atheist advocacy and community organization. Uh, we're basically building the atheist movement out here and supporting people that want to express their secular values. We have an incredible presentation for you today, but before you get started, I, I have a few quick announcements and then we'll hop into it. So the format of today's meeting, uh, like all of our fourth Sunday speaker meetings, which we've been hosting since 1982, um, Atheist United Live, we host some of the best uh, thought leaders, speakers, intellectuals we can find around the world on incredible topics that interest our membership. We usually give them the floor for 20 to 40 minutes, and then we move into a Q&A. You'll notice you all are muted, though. Uh, welcome to our Zoom meeting. Um, in order to keep the meeting as efficient as possible, we will be controlling microphones through this meeting. Uh, it also protects us from uh, Zoom bombers, which uh, do not like some of our meetings, go figure. And we would encourage you to use the chat feature. So below there will be a bar uh, where you can click chat and we'd love for you to share where you're attending from. And if you have any questions for our speaker, please put them there. I'll do my best to compile as many of those questions as possible after the presentation and uh, we'll go through them um, for as, as much time as our speaker is willing to give us. Um, and then if you hang around after that, usually around 1230, we have an after party. Um, uh, Klaus, one of our board members, we like to call the godfather of fun, and he will be hosting the hereafter party uh, for those of you that want to have some, uh, some secular solitude uh, with each other. So hang out with Klaus. That'll be a good time. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you're not a member of Atheist United yet, I really would like you to check it out. Uh, membership is how we sustain our programming here. Uh, these are our top supporters of the organization. Um, and a membership at Atheist United previously was $45 a year. Uh, today, we are announcing and rolling out new membership levels. And our new introductory membership level will start at $2 a month. Um, so we have extremely accessible membership options for you if you are new and looking to join an atheist community or support atheist advocacy, and we'd love for you to check that out. That'll be what, live on our website about an hour after this meeting, so please, please, please visit atheistunited.org to become a member today. Cool. And then um, two other small things. Uh, one, I wanted to uh, give a quick update and apology on... Um, our Facebook group for some of you that have been active in our Facebook group. This is a feature we've had attached to our community for years. Many of you aren't in it, but for those of you that are, um, we have about 700 people in there. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but this past week has been kind of uh, big and controversial in the atheist community over some hot topic issues, um, thanks to uh, Richard Dawkins and his tweeting of late. Um, and I want to apologize for uh, my behavior in that group. I believe I crossed a professional line a few times and believe that for this community to be successful and for us to stand to our secular values, there, we need to differentiate the times between you wear the hat as uh, a leader of a community versus a passionate advocate for your own beliefs and stances. And I believe I can do a better job at that. So I just wanted to quickly mention that that is something me and the board are talking about working on how to facilitate those spaces better. Um, and I'll be looking to move to more of a moderator role and less of a participant in those spaces. And I want to apologize for overstepping that uh, the past week. Um, with that, I want to give the floor to our board chair, who's going to make a quick comment before we move to our speaker today. So this is a, a statement along the same lines as what you're talking about, um, Evan. Um, let me just admit this person. Um, so my statement is, um, uh, in light of recent tensions on the topic of transgender identity that have emerged in secular spaces around the globe, Atheists United would like to make it clear that our organization stands in solidarity with our friends and loved ones who are part of the trans community. We stand and advocate for the rights of those who identify as transgender to be treated with respect and dignity, just as we do for all other marginalized groups. As an ally, Atheist United does not condone a culture whose actions or language disparage the existence of people who identify as transgender and will therefore not provide a space for that type of culture to propagate among our own secular community. Trans rights are indeed human rights. 
So let us move forward by cultivating the best within ourselves by focusing on empathy, kindness, and inclusiveness. And with that, I'll pass it back on to Evan. All right, thank you, Christine. Wonderful, all right, I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. We have had a lot of great speakers over the past year, but this is the topic I think I've been asked to cover the most uh, when I talk to membership, conspiracy theories, QAnon, incels, you name it. Like there is so much conversation happening about this right now. So we are thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be hosting a conspiracy theory expert and researcher, Julia DeCook today. Julia is a specialist on online extremist movements, specifically male supremacist groups like incels, men's rights activists, and communities like uh, Reddit, The Red Pill. She's written on these subjects and been interviewed for both academic and general audiences. The, uh, Julia uh, researches how online extremist communities navigate the constraints of digital infrastructure, specifically in how they respond to attempts to quell and stop their movements in the form of bans and censorship. Her dissertation was a two-year digital uh, ethnograph ethnography uh, where she studied how three male supremacist groups managed to persist despite bans, attempts of censorship, and other threats to their online communities. Through this study, she found that online extremist groups persist despite efforts to stop their spread due to factors like archiving, uh, spreading out their online networking, and through the creation of a strong collective identity. Uh, she's received her doctorate in media and information studies from Michigan State University and is currently an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Loyola University in Chicago. Uh, additionally, she is currently an expert slash fellow for the Institute of Research on Male Supremacy. Uh, yeah, at Loyola, she teaches courses on media theory, technology, social change, social movements, discourse, culture, and propaganda. She's also authored and co-authored our outlets such as Learning Media and Technology, Social Media Plus Society, uh, The Good Men Project, and B2O, an online journal. I am just thrilled, thrilled, absolutely thrilled to be hosting Julia today. And with that, I want to give you the floor. Thank you, Evan, for that wonderful introduction. I hope I live up to the hype that's been built around me. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to come be here today and to listen to my presentation. And so my, just, just a disclaimer, um, like Evan mentioned, my presentation is not going to be very long. It's gonna be anywhere from like 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how quickly I make it through the slides, because I want to give people the opportunity to ask me questions and to have more of a dialogue instead of me kind of talking at you all. Um, and it's also, you know, nicer for me because I've been teaching online for the past year and it can get kind of soul draining to constantly talk at black boxes on Zoom. So I'm really looking forward to being in dialogue with you all today. Um, let's see. All right, can we all see that okay? Are we good? All right, great. Let's see. All right, so the talk, the name of my talk is Understanding the Histories and Cultures of Networked Conspiracies. And so my expertise specifically is not necessarily in like the long history of conspiracy theories of, as they've existed, you know, since time immemorial, but more specifically on how online networks help conspiracy theories spread and how they also help them to be created. Um, obviously, a lot of my work has to look at um, like a historical arc in terms of like understanding how conspiracy theories are formed and how they spread and everything else and why people might believe in them. But most of my expertise is going to be focused on the online side of things. So to kind of begin, like we're kind of living in this current era where the spread of misinformation has become not just a concern among citizens, but also a matter of huge concern among um, governments and other uh, political parties. So obviously what we've seen with the spread of misinformation is that it can have dire consequences if left unchecked as we've seen with COVID-19 conspiracy theories and everything else. But I thought I would start off with um, looking at two definitions to understand the, differ the differences between misinformation and disinformation. And so misinformation, as we keep hearing the term, is information spread without intent or malice so this basically means that the person is spreading false information, believing that it is true, right? So these are the people who will send you things like being like, oh, I saw this on Facebook. Apparently garlic is a great cure for COVID. I'm sure we've seen things similar to this. This can be something as harmless as, um, 
you know, maybe spreading misinformation about how a celebrity died, which is also something that's pretty common, right? But then it can also be something very dangerous in terms of cures and everything else that we've seen with like COVID-19 misinformation, right? And so misinformation basically means is that the person who is spreading it does not really know that it's not not true. So they truly believe that this is accurate information and they were spreading it to friends or family or their online networks. Um, and not necessarily with malicious intent. I mean, sometimes we can obviously argue about that. I get sent a lot of weird things by family members who you know, believe in conspiracy theories, um, but that's neither here nor there. Disinformation, however, is the intentional spread of false or misleading, misleading information to achieve a political or social goal. And so this is what we're seeing with conversations around you know, Russian Twitter bots um, and like troll farms and like these kinds of things, right? These are calculated propaganda campaigns meant to kind of achieve a certain goal. And so disinformation is most often used for political propaganda and to achieve political means. And so this is where we see like differences between these two things. And so often I feel like these terms are used interchangeably, but there are specific differences between them. However, it's really hard to tell which one's which in an online setting where we can't really infer intent as easily. But I thought this would be a good kind of place to start in terms of like defining these two terms. Fun fact about this information is that the term itself is derived from a Russian word that was created um, during the Soviet era, um, basically intentionally to sound Anglo-Saxon because they wanted people to trace back this type of black propaganda as it's known in um, uh, conspiracy theory research circles which means it's like bad, like evil propaganda, right? And uh, the Russians wanted to kind of like aim the blame to Anglo-Saxon countries, but specifically the UK and the US by creating a word that sounded like English. Um, so that's a little fun fact about disinformation, um, kind of etymological roots. But let's get into kind of the meaty part of what we're all interested in, and that's conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories are a lot more complex than people believe them to be. And they're also a lot more complicated than people think that they are. And why and how people end up believing in conspiracy theories is something that has captured the imagination of scholars and just interested citizens alike for decades. In the current era, we can understand conspiracy theories as alternative epistemologies that aim to explain events or circumstances, particularly when people are really powerless to change them. And so obviously we see a lot of conspiracy theories and rumors emerge during times of uncertainty and disaster, particularly during natural disasters, um, and especially during war. These are times when conspiracy theories and rumors often run rampant in order to kind of explain like the circumstances around what's happening to people, right? Um, and what they found in research and on conspiracy theories is that people who feel helpless in most parts of their lives are more apt to believe in conspiracy theories. And so understandably, there is a lot of conspiracy theory belief and adoption and particularly marginalized communities. So for instance, in black and indigenous communities in the United States, there's a lot of belief in certain conspiracy theories that have often turned out to be true, um, particularly when it comes to distrust in the government and everything else, right? Um, but what we're seeing is that this helplessness, this kind of, um, entitled helplessness, I guess, has increased significantly among white populations in the United States. And obviously, if you're lower income, you're more likely to believe in conspiracy theories because the world is operating in a way that you cannot change and, and can't really fully understand due to all these barriers to it. Um, and so conspiracy theories are an easy way to explain things that are unexplainable otherwise. And we live in a culture of conspiracy. So Steph Alpers, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly, wrote a really, really great article about this, which I'd be happy to share with Evan and he could share with um, the group as well, where conspiracy theories have been absorbed into the mainstream. Just thinking about all of the media and literature and everything else that we're consuming, conspiracy theories are rife in the media that we consume. Culturally, conspiracy theories are a very natural part of living in our current society. Even just looking at something like The Matrix, which is a very, very, interesting movie that the far right and the manosphere have adopted as being an example of what's really going on in the world. Um, that the whole idea that we're not being told the truth is very, very kind of deeply embedded within our culture. 
almost everything that we see in terms of media, like it's almost about a conspiracy, even starting with um, something like the All the President's Men, right? The old movie about the Watergate scandal. Like the conspiracy theories have always been kind of this very seductive thing for particularly American society to be attracted to. But this gets into larger conversations about what is truth. And what's also really, really driving some of this um, culture of conspiracy is that there have been so many conspiracy theories that ended up being true. And so we're not just talking about how Black and Indigenous communities in particular have been subjected to government mistreatment, but also things like MK Ultra and like a lot of other things where for a long time, people who were kind of trying to bring awareness to this were told that they were crazy, but then it ended up being true. And this also relates to people who are spreading information about CIA attempts attempt at coups and other types of like government destabilization that ended up being true as well. But we have long lived in a world where there have been notable efforts to increase anti-science, anti-intellectual and anti-establishment ideologies. And we're actually just kind of witnessing the results of a long fought culture war and not the beginning of one. Oppers also argues that conspiracy theories are embedded in the cultural logic of modernity and more specifically, what we're currently witnessing is not just a debate of whether or not truth exists, I, like is there just one singular all-encompassing truth, but rather who is shaping the truth and to what ends we understand the concept of truth and reality in and of themselves. And obviously, just to, you know, we're on Zoom. So obviously we kind of live in an era where we have gone digital, almost all of our lives are completely online. And social media substantially contribute to the spread of mis and disinformation and substantially contribute at the, to the rate at which it spreads. So these are just some news articles and kind of um, graphs that show um, the role of social media. And what's even more um, distressing is that lies and fake news spread a lot faster on social media than truth does. And so obviously this kind of like infodemic as people have referred to it as are really just an extension or more like an intensification of a pre-existing problem where fake news and conspiracy theories have proliferated in recent years. And this of course is in large part due to the affordances of social media, what social media allow people to do um, have reached to mass audiences they wouldn't have otherwise for instance which connect broad networks of people and facilitate the transfer of false information at a faster rate than we've ever seen before. What's also alarming about this research is that um, conspiracy theories and disinformation not only spread faster, but are more popular and more profitable than what is truth um, for platforms especially. And so disinformation and conspiracy theories aren't really bugs in the system, but are a feature of these information architectures. And so basically what we can kind of understand as to why these kinds of things spread faster on digital networks is because misinformation and disinformation and conspiracy theories spread faster in our current era because of the way that platforms use algorithms to categorize people into certain groups to show them consistently show them similar types of content to keep them on the platform. And this is what many of you may have heard it referred to as the attention economy. Keeping eyeballs on the screen as long as popular in one place is the way that these platforms make money because they make money through selling your data to marketers and advertisers. And to marketers and advertisers, they need to have specific types of people to target content to in order to actually make a profit. Um, and so this is part of the reason why we're seeing such like an increase in these types of beliefs and conspiracy theories. And so there's a lot of struggles here that we're kind of seeing, right? Um, we live in a world where anybody can broadcast and spread information and gain huge followings. Um, trying to correct misinformation can often result in a backfire effect where people actually just double down on their beliefs. And the sheer amount of content online makes it really difficult for humans to do all of the moderation. Just thinking about some of these platforms, Facebook, for instance, has billions of users all across the world communicating in different languages and different types of dialogue and everything else that is really, really hard for content moderators to control. And so companies often rely on AI moderation, so artificial intelligence. And a lot of these tools don't understand things like nuance or humor or sarcasm. And they're really, really easy to fool and evade by just adopting new terms or by using emojis or 
acronyms. It's really, really easy to kind of trick a robot in a way, right? Um, and I think what's really crucial to note here is that there, as long as there has been power struggle, there have been conspiracy theories. These kinds of conspiracy theories that are currently circulating um, and informing our social and political realities are everywhere. These aren't just relegated to the dark corners of the internet. These conspiracy theories are spreading on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, which in particular, especially in the past year, have become hotbeds of conspiratorial information. And YouTube has only just increased in, its, um, in the amount of conspiracy theories that are on the platform. And that's not even including the seedier places of the internet that we'd like to kind of point to as like the cause and like origin of a lot of these conspiracy theories. And so in this era of information warfare that we're in, we basically can't escape conspiracy theories and disinformation. It's basically everywhere. It's deeply, deeply baked into a lot of the kind of content that we see. And it's basically facilitated by the very information architecture that's trying to control it. So it's kind of a difficult problem that we're sort of facing. And so obviously these um, kinds of digital misinformation and conspiracy theory campaigns that we see um, have massive implications. Um, these dangerous beliefs and attitudes cause significant harm. Obviously the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes during COVID-19, increase in far right attacks and extremist ideology. And just a few examples here, the Capitol insurrection is probably the most pertinent one, um, the rise of QAnon. One thing that a lot of people have stopped talking about was the AT&T center bombing in Nashville. Do you all remember that? Um, I don't know if you all remember, but they found that the man who committed the bombing like deeply believed in 5G conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories about lizard people, which sound crazy, right? But the thing is though, more and more people are believing in this and there are more and more attacks happening on 5G towers and people who work on cellular network towers because this idea that 5G um, is basically ruining our world and it causes COVID-19 has been spreading significantly. And obviously um, other things that have, have happened due to the spread of misinformation and conspiracy theories, um, tragically is a genocide in Myanmar, the rise of far-right politicians in Indonesia and other countries, and basically almost every single like functioning democracy in the world now has a far right party or figures in power due to the spread of these kinds of networks. And obviously the biggest issue that we're facing right now is the worldwide spread of anti-vaccine and anti-science attitudes, which had been increasing in recent years, but have kind of hit kind of their peak during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the anti-vaccination community and especially the anti-science communities have really kind of taken hold of this crisis as a really great opportunity for them to not only spread their beliefs, but also to attract new members. And so the anti-vaccine community, for instance, um, adoption of the conspiracy theories about vaccines resulted in measles outbreaks and other avoidable diseases in the United States and beyond, but also is increasing issues with vaccination currently as we're speaking today. And we, we ask, you know, can't we just ban them? You know, banning and deplatforming is effective, but a limited short-term solution for halting the spread of extremist rhetoric and conspiracy theories. And what I often found in my research and in my dissertation is that these groups are extremely adept at navigating the constraints of digital platforms. And so constraint here we're imagining as a ban, an attempt to censor, like getting rid of a hashtag, et cetera, et cetera. And despite all of these attempts to kind of get rid of these communities, they're really, really good at exploiting and maneuvering around these constraints because of how deeply familiar they are with the logic of digital infrastructure. Like people know how to evade bans and censorship really easily. It's really not that hard either because of the issue that we talked about earlier about content moderation being just almost this impossible task. And another issue that we're seeing with content moderation is that it's often outsourced. It's outsourced to people who are deeply overworked and very underpaid and whose mental health is not being supported by doing these jobs. And so that's kind of a larger conversation that's happening within other conversations about how do we control this information and conspiracy theories, but how do we protect the people who have to control it? Um, like a lot of these positions only pay minimum wage and you're stuck in front of a computer for 14 hours a day having to see literally the worst of what humanity uploads to the internet. And they get little to no support either. And so these are also conversations that are happening and how we control um, 
disinformation and conspiracy theories online. Um, but before the threat of bans, like all of these groups also engage in archiving of their content on other digital platforms. Um, they move off of these main websites, they start their own forums, they create their own online networks, as we've, as we've seen with things like Parler and Gab and all these other kind of alternative platforms that have emerged in these attempts to get rid of these groups. And then they reemerge also because they use private channels where they can't always be watched, like things like Discord or even Slack which has become really popular during the COVID era, um, where they can kind of avoid like, you know, public prying curious eyes and have these conversations without worry of whether or not they're going to be exposed. Obviously that has pros and cons for these groups, but that's also a tactic that they use to avoid um, basically disappearing from the internet altogether. And so, <laughs> where do we go from here? People ask me this a lot. They're like, so what's the solution? And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> in my opinion, like the internet was a really nice social experiment, but we should just kind of like blow it up and start over. Um, but that's not going to get rid of the problem, right? Like conspiracy theories will always exist. Um, you know, and misinformation and disinformation and people who believe in conspiracy theories are indicative of a larger societal and cultural problem. Getting rid of the information is barely scratching the surface of the issue. We have to address like what it is about our society that makes people want to kind of run to these conspiracy theories as answers to larger societal ills, right? Like this is kind of that whole thing of like, sure, we can get rid of like the symptom, but that doesn't treat the root cause of the disease. And that's another issue that we're grappling with here as well. And so the online world is also not a world apart from ours, but it's a mirror to the offline. It's a reflection, albeit a sped up one. And so the other issue that we run into here too is that social media platforms are designed to maximize engagement and, to, and profit literally at any cost. And there was actually this recent report where one of the top Facebook executives basically said about the genocide in Myanmar, like, oh, that sucks, but at least we made money. And so there's also this massive problem that we're seeing in the tech world where profit at any cost to maximize engagement, to exploit the attention economy, despite the fact that many Facebook employees are saying now that they feel that they are not contributing anything meaningful to the world, that like Facebook does not make the world a better place. Um, we're kind of running into all of these issues kind of in tandem. And so how do we fix it? It seems like a monumental issue because honestly, one of the best solutions is to basically make these massive tech companies completely change their business models, which they're not going to do anytime soon. Facebook made $78 billion in 2020, billion with a B. And so there's no incentive for them to change their business model. There's no incentive for them really to control the spread of conspiracy theories and misinformation because frankly speaking, it makes them money. Even on YouTube, conspiracy theory videos get more views and engagement than other kinds of videos. And so they don't really have like motive to change anything substantially. They'll do things to basically assuage the public and as PR, PR campaigns, like, oh, we banned this hashtag or in our transparency report, you'll see that we banned all these accounts, but that doesn't really get to the heart of the issue. Um, and so this is kind of a larger conversation that we're running up against because the solutions are not things that seem feasible in the current moment. And so how do we imagine otherwise and how do we build a better internet and who, what kinds of people do we need in those spaces in order to kind of ensure that the internet's a better place for everybody? And these are kind of like bigger, large picture philosophical questions that myself and many other scholars are dealing with. All right, thank you so much for listening. I look forward to answering your questions. If you have any follow-up questions that you wanna ask me, my email is here. And if you wanna follow me on Twitter, I don't really post that much, but I retweet fun things a lot of the time. Um, you're more than welcome to. And thank you again for having me here today. Wonderful, thank you for speaking. Um, let me just spotlight some video. Um, a lot of questions. Uh, let's start with, um, definitions a little bit more. Um, someone had a question about the difference between uh, conspiracy theory beliefs and networks versus like religious beliefs and networks and if they're comparable or where the differences would be. 
Um, I think that's, that's such a tricky, tricky thing. And I feel like that's something that a lot of people don't want to touch because I mean, you know, earnestly speaking, like a lot of religions, like what's the difference between a religion and a cult really, right? Um, that's a conversation that we have often too. Um, but conspiracy theories and religious beliefs, I think it, I'm not an expert on either of these things. Like I'm not a religion scholar and I'm not someone who like has like been studying conspiracy theories for a really, really long time. But I can say definitely that there are some overlaps, right? Like both are attempts to explain things that feel unexplainable in the world. They're attempts to create narratives to explain the things that we're seeing and experiencing and to give kind of causality to like a higher being or purpose. Even if that higher being and purpose is the lizard people, um, as in the case of the AT&T conspiracy bombing. And so obviously I don't wanna disparage religion, but also too, the conspiracy theories aren't necessarily these completely irrational beliefs. And that's why a lot of people want to refer to them as an alternative, ep alternative epistemology, a way of understanding and seeing right. the world, as opposed to like, you know, this person's just, you know, mentally unstable and like is trying to create this new reality. And so I think it's, I think, I think it's like, it's really complex because there's so much overlap, right? Um, right. so I don't want to like definitively say anything less like someone starts like harassing me. <laughs> sure, it. sure. And to, to think of these as almost alternative uh, epistemological center, like, are they structured and institutionalized ever? Uh, or are they generally, uh, more chaotic and grassroots in their structure? Or do they run the full gambit of institutional organizational models? I think they definitely run the full gamut. I mean, even just looking at like, you know, um, you know, the example that people use a lot in terms of how conspiracy theories like drive policy and stuff, like even looking at things like as far back as the Chinese Exclusion Act and everything else, right? There's like the the US mm -hmm. government, a lot of politicians like really believe in these very dangerous conspiracy theories about the nature of Asian people. And then also too, even looking at McCarthyism and the conspiracy theories about communism and socialism and the culture wars and like cultural Marxism that like people often like to invoke, like, we can see how deeply embedded some of these conspiracy theories are. And even the term globalist is a dog whistle for Jewish. And so when we hear conservative po po politicians talking about like globalist groups who are trying to kind of, you know, um, like define policy and stuff like beyond their means, like, you know, that's kind of a dog whistle that's used a lot in white supremacist communities to refer to Jewish people. And so conspiracy theories drive a lot of policy, like even like white supremacist conspiracy theories too, drive a lot of immigration policy and everything else. And so it's more deeply intertwined in our current political fabric than a lot of people would like to admit. I mean, even looking at the obvious, Marjorie Taylor Greene is a QAnon conspiracy theorist. Um, and she's a politician, she's in the US House of Representatives. And so it's, it's complex, I think. Yeah. Um... And how connected and networked are some conspiracy theory movements to other conspiracy theory movements? Like, is there a sense that they all, like, is there an intersectionality in that space uh, yeah. that, okay. Yeah, almost always um, a lot of conspiracy theories, particularly in the West, so we're talking about like the US and, and everything else, right? So like Anglo-Saxon Western hemisphere, most conspiracy theories are almost always at their core anti-Semitic, even the lizard people conspiracy theory is anti-Semitic. Um, and so uh, anti-Semitism is often like a glue that binds a lot of these conspiracy theories together. Um, even like the whole ideas about new world order and like everything else like that, like they're also very deeply anti-Semitic. Um, Anti-vaccination communities um, also adopt a lot of these kind of very like racist, like anti-Semitic views and stuff like that too. Misogyny is also since something that binds them together, like especially like anti-feminist views and stuff like that, specifically the feminist movement um, often bind them together. And so there's a few like specifically, um, I guess like root ideologies and beliefs that like bind them all together for sure. Fascinating, okay. And um how is this being studied? I'm so curious how the academic world is trying to wrap their head around the, the tentacles, like where, where does more research need to be done and where is a lot of research happening right now? There's so much research um, going on about this. So there's actually this really great open access journal that um, is being published out of Harvard. It's called the Misinformation Review. Um, all of the articles are open access and they're actually shorter and easier to read. And that's going to be, I think, a really great place to look at in terms of um, 
what is the like thing, things that are going on right now because they publish really quickly too. And so people have tried to understand this like by interviewing conspiracy theorists, by doing surveys, by doing ethnographies, by doing computational things where they scrape a, tw a ton of Twitter data. There's all these different approaches and all of them seem to be coming to a lot of the same conclusions but it's really hard to tell like what directions the research might go in coming years. Got it. There was a question uh, that came in asking about if um, education level or IQ kind of has an impact on uh, susceptibility to conspiracy theory. Anybody is susceptible to conspiracy theory. It does not matter your level of education, your IQ or, or, or social class or anything else like that. Um, anybody is, uh, is susceptible to them. And what we've seen too is that a lot of people express surprise at this, but most of the insurrectionists come from middle to upper middle class. Um, they're highly educated. They had never had formal organizational ties to any of these groups. And yet they all still descended on the Capitol on January 6th. And so that kind of was a shock for many people, but I think for people who have been studying conspiracy theorists for a long time, like we can talk about how like obviously like being well-educated doesn't mean that you won't believe in conspiracy theories. And we're seeing right now with things like COVID-19 that a lot of medical personnel like nurses and doctors and pharmacists are also believing the conspiracy theories. There was that pharmacist in Wisconsin who was charged with a lot of things recently who threw out doses of the COVID-19 vaccine because they believed in the conspiracy theory that it would change your DNA. This is a pharmacist and so no amount of education, even medical and health education, would make someone basically immune to believing in conspiracy theories. And I think that's what's so concerning about them, especially in our current kind of situation. Yeah. I think the most interesting thing I heard when you were speaking was talking about where there's a, wherever there's a power structure or power imbalance is where they thrive the most. Um, is that like, can a more equitable society be a way? Like, I'm, I'm almost curious if society were like, I can't even imagine where we'd start, but the like, let's say even just income inequality was radically reduced tomorrow. Do we think that would have a radical impact on some of these uh, conspiracy theories or misinformation? Or no, because that's that's one thing that a lot of people wanted to point to as like an explanation for like the rise in like far right populism, especially like white yeah. supremacist movements is this kind of narrative around economic anxiety, but it's so much more complex than that, right? Um, yeah. And so I think that that's like obviously like, you know, fixing income inequality would be a great step and like making the world <laughs> a better place, but that still would leave a lot of these other kind of like isms that exist within our world and our cultures and like define our realities, right? someone would find some way to right. still like kind of engage in these conspiracy theories. And so I think it's, um, and what's also interesting too, for instance, is that the anti-vaccination movement is a lot of them are well-educated. A lot of them are wealthy. Um, a lot of people who spread health as misinformation, like looking at people like Gwyneth Paltrow, um, they're all a part of like the upper, upper echelons of society and yet they're believing in and spreading these types of beliefs. And so I don't think income um, inequality is kind of like the main driver of a lot of these conspiracy theories, but other types of anxieties that these conspiracy theories give kind of credence. Too. Right. Yeah. And I feel like I've been asked to be on some conspiracy theory shows just because we're an atheist group. And I think there's this like, well, we're counterculture. So they're counterculture. We are all counterculture. Um, and, I, and I always turn them down. But if I'm hearing you right, there's essentially because it's so embedded in our culture, there's a lot of non- like they're not inherently counterculture. Uh, there are examples yeah. of conspiracy theories essentially being fully part of the culture. So there's yeah. no one way to talk about this, which is frustrating and exciting. <laughs> right. Okay, we have a few questions coming in here on the side that I'm gonna try to read. Um, someone said, uh, I'm sure no age group is innocent, but do we see a measurable difference in what groups are most prolific spreaders of false and disinformation on social media? So that's a really, really good question, because I think people really wanted to believe in this, right? Like, oh, it's just like boomers who don't know how the internet works that are spreading this. But as we've seen with the influx of like QAnon and the COVID-19 conspiracy theories and stuff like that on platforms like Instagram and TikTok, which are mainly populated by young people, there is no age group that is like specifically spreading more or less um, mis or disinformation on social media. Um, 
and and on TikTok especially, there's so much content there that is deeply conspiratorial. Um, and what's also a huge problem that we're seeing is that on Instagram, um, they evade content moderation by posting all of this content to their stories. And so Instagram score, stories disappear after 24 hours. It's a temporary post. And so yeah. that's how they also evade a lot of content moderation and spread a lot of the most dangerous ideas and beliefs there. So, Okay. We had a question come in that says, uh, what do you think the role of a librarian can be? As a librarian, I feel like uh, an information first responder and a, a social second responder. I think librarians have a really, really important role in society just in general. So, you know, thank you for being a librarian. But I think the issue is, is that this isn't just an issue about access to information. Like everyone has access to more information than we've ever had access to in any other point in human history. The, the problem has kind of become the ability for people to craft and define their own realities and to find other people who, are, who will validate and support and even help them continue to build that reality completely unchecked. And so it information does not change behavior. That's like one of the things that a sociology professor of mine said to me. And so it doesn't matter if you give people all of the facts, like facts won't necessarily change a person's attitudes or beliefs or ideology, which is what we're running up against. And so, I think information is obviously a very, very important thing. I think um, information is crucial to healthy communities and democracies, but we're in a really complex and strange era where a lot of that conversation is who gets to control that information. Well, that kind of leads to the obvious question of like, well, how, how do we engage these conversations? Uh, what do we say to someone uh, we think who is lost to a conspiracy theory um, to try to change their mind or steer them towards truth? I think that's so hard. And honestly, <laughs> like, I mean, my students ask me that question all the time. Like, you know, oh, my, my grandfather is a QAnon conspiracy believer now. Like, what do I say to them? And honestly, it's, it's a lot harder than people think it is. And so obviously the most important thing to do when you're engaging with these people is to remember that a lot of them don't want to have their minds changed, right? And so I think that um, the most important thing that you need to do when in interacting with these people or trying to understand like the root of why they believe in these things is to not ask them questions that put them on the defensive, but more and like to like obviously like to stay like patient and calm because that's a lot harder said than done, right? But more about like questioning like where did you see this? And like, why do you believe it? And like all these other things, right? To kind of like make themselves talk themselves out of it as opposed to trying to like hit them with like facts and everything else. Um, and obviously like every single person is different. Their amounts of kind of like um, belief in it is different. And some people are kind of hopeless. And I think that's the thing that people don't want to like readily admit is that there are some people who are so deep in the rabbit hole is that they may not ever come out. Um, and so like, I think like me personally, I've been looking at stuff from the seventies about like cult deprogramming. And a lot of those are just like, you know, absolutely unhinged methods where they like kidnap people from like cults and stuff like that and try to like deprogram them. And some of them were quite violent, oh, but wow. it's the, the most important thing to do, especially if like you don't fear for your own safety and having these conversations is to make sure that you're kind of questioning like the person to kind of explain to you their beliefs and kind of like why they believe them and stuff in the hope that they'll come to the realization that maybe this isn't real. Right. But that's a lot harder said than done. Well, and there's a lot of conversation, um, at least in atheist spaces about how much we should debate uh, religious people who we think have essentially conspiratorial beliefs. Um, and I'm curious if you have any thoughts or comments on that kind of direct public confrontation. Does that legitimize their belief or does that actually work to like get your counter ideas to a public that is always conspiracy biased? I think especially with the, some of these more kind of prominent conspiracy theory groups, I see in the chat, people are talking a lot about flat earthers. They love these kinds of public dialogues because they will spin it in any way that they can to basically convince the members that like, oh, we won this debate. You see this a lot with white supremacists and stuff like that too, where they'll be like, debate me in order to like <laughs> prove like how right, right they are, right? right? It's just a debate. Um, it's, 
all press is good press, right? Like any kind of oxygen that like amplifies their views is a good opportunity for them, especially when it comes to these sorts of debates where a lot of the groups uh, that are that are going to be tuning in are people who really deeply believe in these beliefs and views. And anything that like, you know, the debater says, it's just going to be seen as a win. Like even the fact that they're engaging in this like public spectacle is going to be seen as a win because it means that they've become accepted into right. the mainstream. And so it, on some level, like, okay, sure, there might be some benefit in having these conversations in a public forum, but understanding kind of the motivations why they would even want to do that in the first place is also something that adds to the complexity of this issue. Right. And, and there's a lot of, like, uh, pushback when people are trying to not have those debates or shut down those debates right now. I, I mean, like Jordan Peterson's the one famously getting the most right. attention for um, people not wanting to engage with him and him just saying, I'm having an open debate about everything. Um, like, is, is that all connected kind of that, that, that response to talk about free speech in that way? I think so. Definitely. Especially when it comes to like, oh, the marketplace of ideas kind of thing that's pushed very heavily, right. But the best ideas will naturally win and come to the forefront. And so they see themselves as like actively engaged in that, um, and so I think like to them, like being like, well, I'm open to debating and you're not, therefore like my views are better than yours. That's kind of like the straw man argument that they kind of create, right? And so yeah. it, it's really, really interesting how they use like public debate and like public forums as like this weaponized form of like furthering their ideology. Right. I mean, a more specific one. Um, my dad's family is from the Northeast going back to the mid 1600s. Some of the family moved to the South after World War One and World War Two, and their grandchildren have been so indoctrinated by the Southern lost cause ideology that they identify with Confederate history, even though many of their ancestors fought for the Union and none were in the South during the Civil War. How do we build a pro-critical thinking culture that is effective? That's like beyond the scope of my expertise, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think this, this highlights the thing that we're talking about, right? Like people, like, and like also too, like the, like, so I, um, my family's from Michigan, like the sheer amount of people in Michigan who fly Confederate flags is absolutely shocking, right? Um, it's like, do you not, do you not know where we are? Um, obviously, but it, it is really interesting to, because um, this gets back to the issue of like, it doesn't, no amount of like critical thinking or education will make someone not susceptible to conspiracy theories. Like some of these like very prominent conspiracy theorists, like Jordan Peterson and like everyone else, like, and like, you know, that's probably a hot topic to say that he's a conspiracy theorist, but he is, he has a PhD. He's a professor at the university of Toronto. Um, like these are people who are highly well-educated, you know? And I think to, um, to assume that critical thinking is going to be like something that fixes this or even something like media literacy, um, it's something that still doesn't get to kind of like a lot of the root issues. Um, right. And instead it's just trying to kind of throw these solutions, um, but it doesn't really get to the fact that people believe in this stuff because it gives their life and being a sense of meaning. Um, and a lot of them can make a lot of money off of it as we've seen with like these social media platforms and like all these like famous YouTubers who spread these types of conspiracy theories right. and everything else. And so it, it, it's really difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, that's, yeah, I have a million thoughts off of that one, but we have another question come in. I'm a fifth grade teacher and I've had a few students bring up conspiracy theories in my class. I'm sure their parents told them. And the question is basically, <clears throat> how much do conspiracies get passed on generationally or through families uh, versus other means? Um, I'm not super sure about how how much of an impact like family has like obviously like family is one of your first fears of socialization and so like obviously like I can see the connection but also too like a lot of these fifth graders definitely have access to YouTube and YouTube is absolutely rife with conspiracy theories and so even like YouTube kids has a lot of like really disturbing content on there um and especially uh, fifth graders can, right can you give us if some examples Oh, no, not even just like conspiracy theory stuff. Like YouTube kids have stuff that's like borderline pornographic. They have stuff that like, oh, it could be child abuse. Some of it is like tar like material that's targeted to pedophiles that like aren't explicitly sexual. It's, it's really, really dark and creepy. Uh -huh. YouTube is a creepy, creepy place. Um, but yeah, if you have fifth graders who are telling you these things, they're most likely consuming conspiracy theories on YouTube themselves. And the, the, 
the line of like gaming videos, like a lot of like kids really like watching like those let's play videos and stuff like that, right? A lot of white supremacists and other extremist groups will target those videos to eventually show the viewers like more conspiratorial, like extremist videos. Um, if you just let it like autoplay, like the autoplay feature on YouTube, you will most likely within three or four videos be exposed to something that's conspiracy theory related if you're watching a gaming video. Um, so I think uh, it's- For the for those of you yeah. that uh, don't spend much time on YouTube and don't know what Julie is talking about, that there's this extremely popular movement of uh, basically people watching other people play video games and they live stream it online. Um, and so the- person playing that game is able to talk to the audience the entire time they're going. Um, and this has been a big part of our culture for many years now. Um, and a lot of young people are just, you know, their, their new heroes and followers are video game players around the world. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, how do we follow your work and support other people doing work like yours? Um. <laughs> Well, invite us to things like this, obviously. This was awesome. a lot of really great conversation. Um, obviously, um, my website was just share shared. It looks like Klaus shared my website. So I try to update my website pretty regularly um, with like things that I recently published and stuff. But um, Twitter, especially, if you can find academics who are on Twitter, um, they will most likely be tweeting a lot about our recent publications and everything else on there. Um, so that's a really good place to kind of keep up to date with what a lot of academics are doing. And like, I'm not someone who tweets a lot. I'm just not a poster of, but other academics will tweet, uh, will tweet stuff about like things that they're noticing and give commentary and everything else on it. Um, but yeah, I, at least on Twitter will share, um, like articles I've written, like interviews I've done and everything else. So, yeah, wonderful. And then just kind of a last, uh, question, like, do you think that for me, when I, when I see presentations like this and I see the extent of uh, conspiratorial beliefs and spaces, I feel like it really uh, chips away or debunks a lot of our ideas about kind of the, the uber rational man, the, the, the idea that we can like rationalize our way out of all problems, uh, which has been very, in some ways, popularized by the skeptic and atheist community uh, for many years. Um, like, do you agree with that? Do you think we're like ultimately really uh, biased brains and can always fall for things no matter how much education and skepticism or we can kind of ingrain that to such an extent that we are always ninjas against uh, pseudoscientific and misinformation? So I firmly believe that humans are like extremely complicated, irrational, like deeply emotional human beings as much as we want to believe in the whole thing that like, you know, rational choice theory, people will always choose the most rational choice has never panned out because people very rarely make the best decisions for themselves, right? And so, and I think it's like, it can be really discouraging to be like, oh, like there are people who are highly educated who run, who like fall into these conspiracy theories and stuff like that, right? Um, and yeah, anybody is susceptible to them, especially if you experience a, a, a particular event in your life that creates a high amount of anxiety and uncertainty, like your brain will automatically just try to latch onto something to give explanation and meaning to that experience. As much as you want to be rational about it, and some people are better at talking themselves down than others. And this is where kind of like the, the, the neurochemistry or psychology behind what makes someone believe in a conspiracy theory is really, really hard because we don't really know. Um, and so it's just like, you know, even like we talked about, like a pharmacist believed in these conspiracy theories, right? Like medical personnel, doctors, nurses spread conspiracy theories all the time. And so even having all that extensive medical and health training doesn't make you immune. And so like, what are we supposed to do here? And I say, I think that's kind of like the larger conversation we're having. And so um, I think George like pointed out, like, you know, uh, the propensity to find causality where there is none is deeply ingrained in human nature. And that's correct. Like human beings naturally look for patterns um, in order to give meaning and explanation to the world that they see. Um, and so I think it's something that is like beyond just educating yourself or like giving yourself enough critical thinking skills to not fall into these kinds of like conspiracy theory traps. So yeah, yeah. Wonderful. And and I, it, you you put up a slide earlier that talks about all of the places that uh, like different things are spreading with social media at the top, but immediately we had some of these 
traditional high information institutions like TV stations as, you know, right up there. Um, and I think people think of those as institutions that kind of can weed out this stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it's so appreciative to have you here to help us talk through and explain how it is insidious in the culture itself. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think Tom Brashannon had his hand up for a while. I don't know if he still wants to ask a question. Uh, yeah, he'll put it in the chat if he's got a question. Um, okay. Cool. Any other last questions before we uh, turn off the live stream? Go ahead and put them in the chat right now, folks. Is there research about self-regulation emotionally in relationship to seeing conspiracies as a problem? I'm not sure, but I imagine there would be, especially in psychology literature. Um, and so I think that's something definitely to maybe look at, but I also think sometimes um, conspiracy theories themselves like help people engage in emotional self-regulation in a way. Um, but um, I'm sharing the name of that journal I mentioned in this information review in the chat, if anybody wants to go look at those articles. Um, mm. There was actually a special issue of it that was just published about kind of the history of conspiracy theories and propaganda. Um, and yeah, these articles are short. I think they're like two to 3,000 words long. And so they're also right. really great kind of short reads for people to engage with. Uh, there was a question earlier I skipped over. How much does a sense of injustice contribute to a, a basically, I, I don't wonder if it's asking about kind of correlation of sense of injustice and mm -hmm. conspiratorial mindset. It contributes a lot. So like uh, feeling that you've been wronged, feeling that you have, you are helpless, like feeling that like they're has been like a great kind of like injustice um, that has happened to you or your community um, is something that is directly correlated often with conspiratorial thinking. Um, and so that sense of injustice can be due to anything, right? Um, and for some, there's like more kind of like historical precedent than others, but right. definitely there is a connection between like feeling like you've been wronged and feeling that there has to be some kind of retribution um, in believing these types of things. Um, right. Is there a source to find these dog whistle words that you have mentioned? Yes, there is. And um, let me see. The mm -hmm. Anti-Defamation League actually uh, published something in 2019 about anti-Semitic dog whistles today. Um, Wonderful. And the Southern Poverty Law Center will also publish um, reports like talking about like specific dog whistles that have emerged and stuff like that. Um, here, so. Here's an article about that. And then there's also um, the hate symbols database that they maintain at the ADL is also quite good. Um, and that might be a really, really interesting resource for people. Um, let me let me actually find um, the link to it to share with people. Cool. Oh, it's called Hate on Display, the Hate Symbols Database. And this also will like kind of address some of the dog whistle type thing. Um, there was a question about some of these new informational tools such as Snopes.com uh, and how useful those are at dispelling theories or if there's a sense of what type of impact they make in the world since they trace back information to its original sources to dismiss the theories. Um, no, because that's the thing with conspiracy theorists, that they'll always move the goalposts or they'll be like, oh, Snopes is being run by a cabal of globalist elites and like trying to like achieve, <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, I think like on some level, um, like we fact want to believe that like fact checking will work, but then they'll just be like, oh, these are clearly like, you know, liberally biased, like, you know, feminist organizations that are just, you know what I mean? Like the goalposts yeah. always move. So. And equally, do is there any sense or research about satire, like uh, what Stephen Colbert did with his show on Comedy Central for years? There is some research on satire. Actually, um, the professor Donegal Young um, actually just published a book about it. It's called um, Irony and Outrage, um, the Polarized Landscape of Rage, Fear, and Laughter in the United States, uh, which is more about like political polarization and stuff like that. But um, on satire and politics, that's basically what it's about. Um, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, and she's been, she's been doing research on the kind of relationship between like irony and rage and yeah. satire and stuff for much longer. And then one thing I wanted to clarify, we just talked about uh, feelings of injustice can lead to uh, higher 
uh, propensity or excitement for conspiratorial ideas, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, identities that experience more injustice. Like, I, I guess I, I'm kind of like, just because you're privileged doesn't mean you don't fall for conspiracies right. is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> and just because you're privileged doesn't mean that you don't think that you're the victim of injustice, right? Mm, yeah. um, and so I think that's another thing that we have to kind of keep in mind here too. Right, wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm going to share my, my Twitter again um, uh, in a chat if anybody wants to follow me. And if not, um, I think I, I shared the email um, at the end of the slides. And... Wonderful. Thank you, Julia. Um, there was a question on, on Facebook. Um, oh, Darren okay. McDonald wants oh. to know, uh, why false conspiracies spread better than actual conspiracy, i.e. why QAnon has more traction than the Catholic or evangelical sexual abuse scandals? I, I can't really speak to why, um, other than the fact that obviously like the Catholic church like spends a lot of money and controlling information about them too. Um, I can't say too much about that. I'm at a Catholic institution, but obviously like who is controlling the spread of information and like the, the amount of money that organizations have and like basically combating like bad press about them like plays a factor. QAnon like has no organization. It has no institution. It can be molded and shaped to whatever people need it to be. Um, and that's why it's so powerful and spreading. Um, mm. So obviously we have to think about like whether or not these conspiracy theories themselves are tied to organizations or institutions in terms of understanding their spread. Right. And yet, right. like Christine said, Catholic sexual abuse is not a conspiracy, so. Well, with that, um, I want to end the live stream part of this. If you're willing to hang out and people want to keep asking you questions, uh, I think that would be awesome. But uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Atheist United and our community for speaking to us today. And um, this is wonderful. I hope more people follow your work and support your research and uh, get involved with organizations like the uh, Institute of Research on Male Supremacy, which are just doing incredible work these days. So thank you for your time. Thank you.